Hello everyone and welcome to this Trails in the Sky retrospective. I made this over the course of five months and it took a lot of work, but I'm proud of how this turned out. If you want to support videos like this, you can check out my Ko-Fi in the description. Ko-Fi supporters will gain access to videos like this a whole week early as well as other perks, so go ahead and check that out. You can donate as little as a dollar to gain access to these perks, or you can commission me to make artwork for you and gain access that way. It's up to you. Either way, let's get on with the show. Hello everyone, it's been a while. So I'm sure a lot of you guys were expecting the Golden Sun 2 review next, but that one's going to need a little bit more time in the kitchen. So without further ado, we're actually going to be talking about something a little bit different today, so let's jump right on in. The Legend of Heroes is an old series existing all the way back on PCs in the Famicom and Super Famicom era. While I and many people in the States have never really experienced most of these games, they were a fairly big hit in Japan. Now this video is not going to be about the franchise as a whole or about their developer Nihon Falcom, as there are plenty of videos talking about that. Today we're going to be talking about the Legend of Heroes Trails series or the Kiseki series as it's known in Japan, in case you find yourself confusing the title with these games. Now something crazy is that I did not anticipate I would love Trails to the degree that I do. See, there are plenty of games that I have enjoyed over the years, though most are usually a one-off for me. However, I've always had these core game series that when I played one game, I played all of them. Those being Zelda, Metroid, Fire Emblem, Kingdom Hearts, and of course Golden Sun. These come to me extremely rarely though, and I hadn't experienced one for quite a while. So let's rewind to 2019 for a bit. I had heard from several people in passing about the Legend of Heroes Trails franchise, most fans claiming that it was the best storyline ever, and that the world building was amazing, and that it was a behemoth of a series that was going on for around 8 games at the time of talking to them. Now for me, while I'm sure some would take their word for it, I've been disappointed by this sort of hype a number of times, so generally speaking I sort of dismissed it. I also thought Trails might have been some sort of action RPG, which does not necessarily mean I would have hated it, but it's just kind of an expectation I had. But when I saw my friend stream the intro to Cold Steel 1, I was surprised to see it looked like turn-based combat with a tactical aspect. Well, after the stream, I decided to give the series a shot. Thanks Blaze, I'm in hell now! After that stream, I researched into the exact order and jumped into Trails in the Sky, a game that was a slow burn, but by the end I was so hooked that I jumped right into the second game. That was late 2019, and here we are today in 2022. A lot has happened the last few years, but I am here today having beat every single Trails game in the West. Nine games as of this video. It has been... Quite a journey, to say the least. If you follow my Twitter or have talked to me much in the last few years, you would know that I not only like Trails, I won't shut up about it. Now I listen to Trails music all the time, I bring it up in casual conversation regularly, I've done tons of fan art and talked to other fans. YouTube is always recommending Trails stuff to me, and in particular, I've listened to Azure Arbitrator more times than I can even count. So this is what it's like falling down a rabbit hole, huh? Others have made their own impression videos on this, and since this is still a relatively unknown franchise, I decided I'd add my own take to this. In actuality though, I want to make this video to spread some awareness for the series because I think this series deserves more recognition than it's gotten, and I feel there aren't enough people playing the games, and hopefully this video will help amend that at least a little bit. But while I could talk about the whole franchise, if I tried to cram it all into one video, it would probably be either way too long, or I'd be skimming over way too much. This is a series that has gone on for 9 games now, just to remind you, many of them being Persona levels of long, so instead I want to break this down into 3 or possibly 4 videos. Cold Steel is kind of a behemoth of itself, so if it ends up being 4 videos, well, you know why. Today we're going to be talking about the first arc of the Trails series, the Liberal arc, also known as the Trails in the Sky trilogy. I will do my best not to spoil things, but since the second and third games are direct sequels, it'll be kind of hard to completely avoid that, considering you'll be seeing the visuals of the game. Games, but I will do my best and if you need to go ahead and play the games first and come back this video will be here waiting for you. Also going to say this right now, these games are incredibly story heavy, even more so than most other RPGs. If you are averse to reading multiple novels worth of text, this series might be hard to get through. I know my first impressions were something along the lines of, they just keep going! And pretty much the rest of the series doesn't change that. Now, as a Golden Sun and Camelot fan, I'm used to overly wordy stories, but if you are not, 
Well, there are other aspects to enjoy, but the story is one of the main reasons people enjoy these games, so expect lots of reading. So without further ado, let's jump into this with Trails in the Sky. world of trails set in the continent of Zemuria, a massive supercontinent composed of several nations, the most notable of these being the Erebonian Empire and the Calvardian Republic. The Erebonian Empire, having existed for a long time, ever expands in its territory, while Calvard seeks the same. These two nations have been at odds with each other for years, with several smaller nations feeling the pressure of this feud. One of these nations is the small kingdom of Liberal to the southwest of the continent. This country, a small peaceful nation, rich in culture and history, was suddenly attacked by the Empire in what was known as the Hundred Days War. The end of the war resulting in Liberal managing to repel the Empire, but at a great cost. Ever since, tensions have calmed, but nonetheless the scars of this conflict remain, especially in the north. The Trail series begins ten years after the war, in the Kingdom of Liberal, long after the dust has settled. By the way, this is not a tactical RPG series, even though this sounds like this could be a Fire Emblem intro. I just wanted to make sure you knew that. Trails is interesting in the sense that it can be broken down into small story arcs. Each of these arcs are set within a single country in the land of Zemuria, and follow a different protagonist within that country. Think of it a little like how JoJo soft reboots itself with each part if you've seen that anime or maybe the MCU. Basically, you'll see characters from the older arcs appear in the newer arcs, but for each arc you follow a brand new set of main characters. The first arc is the Trails in the Sky trilogy known as the Liberal arc. Like I explained earlier, this arc is set in the Kingdom of Liberal, and compared to the rest of the settings, this one feels the most traditional. The second arc, which was stuck in Japan for years but is finally getting localized, is the Crossbell arc. The two games in this arc are Trails from Zero and Trails to Azur. Crossbell is a small nation wedged in between the Erebonian Empire and the Republic of Calvard. It is also where a lot of the political tensions between these two titans are really developed. The third arc is the Trails of Cold Steel game set within the Erebonian Empire. This is the longest arc in the entire series, and therefore, I don't want to dive too much into it. Anyway, let's talk about Liberal for a moment, since that is the focus of this video. Compared to its surrounding nations, they are very rooted in their culture, and have kind of an old-timey atmosphere to much of the country. However, this does not mean they do not have technology. See, around 50 years prior to the start of the story, some scientists created a power known as Orbal Technology. Orbal Tech is similar to Materia in Final Fantasy VII, but without the environmental destruction. It's very multifaceted and is used to power pretty much everything. Lights on the road, airships, weapons, and eventually even cars in the Crossbell and Erebonia arcs. Every nation is currently utilizing this tech, and you'll notice how this technology is rapidly advancing as you progress through this series. And it's spherical! <laughs> spherical! Now one last thing before we jump into the games proper. There's one more faction I need to discuss, the Bracer Guild. So basically, Bracers are an organization that functions outside each government. Their job is to protect the citizens of the continent doing both small jobs and sometimes stopping major incidents. This is important because the main characters of the Sky Games are Bracers, and you really get to become acquainted with their rules. Alright, so with that lore dump out of the way, it's finally time for us to move on to the first game in the Sky Trilogy, Trails in the Sky First Chapter. Let's take a look at the first game in the entire series.
Trails in the Sky, also known as Trails in the Sky First Chapter, or FC for short, is a very humble beginning to the series. While later series are very drenched in political conflict, war tension, classism, and geopolitics, Sky First Chapter, much like Liberal itself, is very laid back and simple. While it has some of these elements, First Chapter is written much more like a slice of life fantasy adventure. It follows Estelle and Joshua Bright as they explore the land of Liberal, unraveling a mystery in the shadows. At the heart of this journey though is Estelle, Joshua, and the land of Liberal itself. Now I don't plan to do a full plot synopsis here, but I do feel it is appropriate to discuss the story, setting, and characters of this game, since the story is probably one of the most important aspects of these games. This was actually kind of difficult to write in a way that does it justice, because I don't want to recap the plot and spoil the experience. This will especially be a challenge in second chapter, but I'll cross that bridge when we get there. I do want to talk about the opening hook of the game though, so let's start there. Trails in the Sky opens with our main character Estelle waiting for her dad Cassius to come home from his work as a bracer. However, when he comes through the door, he tells his daughter he brought her a gift, a new brother named Joshua. Joshua appears to be keeping secrets of some sort as we get to be acquainted with Estelle's bright personality. We flash forward several years as Estelle and Joshua are now up and coming bracers. During these opening chapters, Estelle's dad disappears, and the rest of the game becomes Estelle and Joshua exploring the land of Liberal, unraveling a conspiracy as the two become closer and closer. Estelle and Joshua Bright are some of the most enduring protagonists I've ever had the pleasure of following in a game. Bestelle is a very bubbly and energetic girl that is very about whacking things first, asking questions later. She is an absolute goofball, and despite her last name, isn't always the brightest one of the bunch. Meanwhile, Joshua is a boy with a mysterious past and a calm composure on the outside, though often he is smart enough to kind of make up for Estelle not really knowing things a lot of the time, though he is often the butt of several jokes throughout the game as well. Now to talk about how these games are structured. The first two games are broken down into fairly lengthy chapters, each contained within one of the five major regions of Liberal. Rolant, Bose, Ruan, Zeiss, and Grandsel the capital. All of these regions feature a central town of their region's namesake, as well as smaller areas surrounding these towns. So this is a really weird comparison, so bear with me, but when I first played this game, traveling across Liberal really reminded me of the roots in Pokemon. You explore Liberal on foot, completing jobs for NPCs, and visiting guild branches in every town to get their approval to become full-fledged bracers. Though obviously there are no gyms, and Trails is notably more linear and story-driven, first chapter is very much a road trip with Estelle and Joshua, as it is about the main plot. For some, this may not seem all that exciting, but I found it very cozy, and I really enjoyed my time with this story. The Kingdom of Liberal really is put first and foremost in this game, and it does a great job of teaching you everything about it. Their culture, their feelings on the Hundred Days War, tensions with the Empire, how people go about their days, and you really get a feeling that the world is very alive. If you choose to talk to NPCs in any of these Trails games, they are incredibly fleshed out, and you'll often see their lives updating as the days pass. I'll have more to say about that in the following videos, but it is an absurd attention to detail in the writing. This comes with a downside though. I want to say right away that this story is really good and gets more exciting as it goes along with an ending that feels satisfying and meaningful, while making you want more, in a good way. That said, the game's pacing for most of it is a bit slower than most of its RPG contemporaries. This is done on purpose to put you into the character's shoes and immerse you in the world before things escalate, but I know friends who really did not enjoy the plot coming off the prologue. Trust me, it gets way better. That said, I think the characters are the real star of the Sky games. Now, I already talked about Estelle and Joshua, but there are also several guest characters that join you over the course of the game. There's Sherazard, Shara for short, who is a senior bracer who is a bit of an alcoholic and sadist. She is old friends with Estelle and Joshua's dad and is treated as the more seasoned member of the group. There are also a good number of comedic scenes involving her being undefeated in drinking contests, much to the dismay of Olivier. Then there's Chloe, a girl from Genis Royal Academy and my personal pick for best girl. She has a bit of a mysterious side and has a pet bird named Sieg. She is the main focus in the Ruin arc of the game and I don't want to say too much for the sake of spoilers. Um, I could see someone's initial take of her being maybe too perfect or something since she helped out with the Ruin orphanage and just seems really nice and everything, but she is a very strong character that is not who she seems. Just take my word for it, she's great. Also, can't go wrong with Sieg, it's a friggin' pet bird. 
Tita is the small engineer girl who is a genius with machines coming from a family of engineers. Also, she is the most adorable character ever. She uses a cannon and is also a geek whenever technology is involved. Her parents are away for work a lot, so she spends a lot of time with her grandpa, who is one of the scientists responsible for orbital technology in the first place. She is incredibly smart and helps out a lot during her chapter. Combat-wise, she's a bit squishy though, so be careful using her. Then there's Cloud Strife, I mean, uh, Agate, a senior bracer and a loner with a huge sword and a bad attitude. But you can tell deep down that he is a bit of a softie, and I just like characters like that. In first chapter, he doesn't get a lot of time to develop, but he's plenty likable. Zen is probably the most forgettable character in first chapter, but I think he's cool. He is a mad tank and does serious damage. Now he isn't playable for very long in first chapter, but he gets a bit more time in the sun in second chapter. Then there's the man himself, Olivier, who is probably the fan favorite character of the entire Trail series. This man is a goofball, always going on about love and injecting chaos into every single scene he appears in. Legit, this man is pretty much universally loved by every Trails fan, and whenever you hear that loot, it means you're in for a good time. Now despite my praise, I didn't go that deep in regards to these characters, and this is largely because they are not the focus of first chapter specifically, but they do get a lot of development in the sequels. The focus of first chapter is Estelle and Joshua. Now putting aside some controversial aspects of this, at the heart of the Sky series is Estelle and Joshua as they grow to have feelings for each other. Joshua is an adopted sibling, so I don't want to start a whole debate about this because it's just sort of how the entire Trail series is at this point, but I will say I personally love their dynamic and I think it's written and presented pretty well, and I think they're actually pretty cute. These two are my personal favorite characters in Sky, and you really do root for Estelle over the course of the game, and I'd find it hard to imagine someone would hate her by the end of the game. She really is just that likable. There are also a handful of non-playable characters I want to mention that I just think are cool. First is Cassius Bright, Estelle's father, who is a masterclass, S rank bracer. He is a very goofy man despite his talents and has shown over the course of the games to have sort of a mysterious past. With a bit of a running joke being that everyone seems to know Estelle's dad for some reason, leading Estelle to react with this a lot. Wa 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 wa? You know my dad? Now another one is this professor you see from time to time. I liked him a lot, but for kind of a dumb reason. So, um, I'm not sure how many of you guys will draw this parallel, but when I played this game, I immediately noticed this game had pre-rendered sprites like Golden Sun, and that it had these ancient mysterious elemental towers. At the top of one of these was this dude that looked like young Kraden from Golden Sun, that also happened to be an archaeologist just like Kraden. So yeah, I just kept calling him young Kraden. He helps out a few times, and in most chapters you can find a side quest with him at one of the towers doing research. Like I said, he very much reminds me of Graydon. Then there's the reporters Niall and Dorothy who are largely around for comedic relief. Despite being reporters, they actually help out a lot and they are super endearing. I also like this game's villain a lot. I won't say too much, but I think he is one of the most successful sympathetic villains I've ever seen. He just needs more power. Alright, I think that's enough story, let's go ahead and jump right into the gameplay. I think a big problem of the first three Trails games is that on release the combat animations were very slow, to put it lightly. This is an issue that never really disappears from Trails, as I think they all have pretty slow fights sometimes. However, when I played this, a turbo feature was added, which speeds up everything from exploring to cutscenes to combat. Every single game up to this point has turbo now, so it's not much of an issue anymore. This also helps in the overworld in Sky 1st chapter and 2nd chapter in particular, since there's a lot of walking around and no fast travel, so turbo really does help a lot in those instances. If the gameplay looks like it's sped up most of the time during this video, that's just because I use Turbo that much when I play these games. Anyway, on that note, let's jump into the real meat and potatoes of the game, the combat. This game is a turn-based RPG featuring a more strategic combat system than most. I'd say it's probably most similar to Final Fantasy X if you've played that. Characters' turns dynamically shift during combat depending on what actions you take, meaning that you are always trying to take the turn order into consideration. However, this is only the basics. This series has a rather cute naming gimmick for personal skills and magic called Arts and Crafts. Arts are this game's magic, though they take more than one turn to cast, with different spells having different casting times. In this series, there are things you can equip to lessen casting times, but this is always something to take into consideration. Personally though, I don't like using magic in this game for one reason, Impede. 
Basically, some attacks carry an impede property that cancels out spells. It is great when you do it, but it can be very annoying when it happens to you. Luckily, you don't lose MP when impeded, but you ideally want to try and cast a spell before that can happen to you. The craft system, however, is a unique system to this game, and what makes trails unique. Basically, crafts are characters' personal skills that use their CP meter. These skills are unique to every character. Crafts do not delay like arts, but have an interesting emphasis on choosing to use smaller quick attacks, or alternatively, you can let the CP meter build up to use a character's S-craft. S-crafts are basically like the Trail series equivalent to Limit Breaks in Final Fantasy. These are the flashiest attacks in every game, and I adore them. What brings this all together is that characters and enemies have ever-shifting positions during combat. Similar to Chrono Trigger, many arts and crafts have area of effect properties, so there is a good amount of emphasis on positioning and maximizing damage. Also something neat is that on the turn wheel there's these special bonuses. If either you or an enemy has it land on their turn, they will get the effect. These range from heals to guaranteed critical hits. Also something very important is if you have an S-Craft ready, you can interrupt turns at any point using them. This is incredibly useful in this case, since you can snipe critical hits from under enemies and it can be really devastating having that extra damage. Overall, this is probably one of the most tactical battle systems I've ever seen in a turn-based RPG to this day that wasn't a flat-out strategy RPG like Fire Emblem. It feels really good to play and for me personally, it's the kind of battle system I would want to make and it is one of my favorite battle systems I've played in any RPG. Now if you are a fan of newer Trails games like Cold Steel but have never played these, I do want to buffer this. This is the first game and later titles, including the sequel in small ways, do play better. I started with this game so I didn't have the newer ones to compare it to. I can say right now that when I first played the game I loved the combat system, but jumping backwards immediately after Cold Steel 4, the crafts kind of suck compared to later games. In fact, I feel the Sky games in particular want you to use arts more at times, which is not how I personally like my trails, but it's something. If you're jumping backwards, I think you'll still find this game charming, but you might struggle more than someone playing this game as their first trails. Now for newcomers, I think a benefit to playing this as your first trails is this is probably the most simple the combat gets. The later games never really remove much, but they do add more to the system, and there's so much I want to say about that when we get there. Now to go into the party building stuff. Arts in this series is handled somewhat similar to material from Final Fantasy VII. Basically, you have these gems called Quartz that, when equipped on a character, let you use magic depending on the elemental types you chose. So water spells will require a lot of water quartz, and wind spells require a lot of wind quartz, etc. There are also spells that you can get by mix matching, but there's a spell list in the in-game manual, so if you want to figure out what spells you can get and how to get them, definitely check that out. So you might be thinking, can you just make super OP spells early on? Well the answer is mostly no for one reason. Each character has a thing called an orb mint, and you have to spend materials to unlock slots in the orb mints. This will allow you to equip more quartz and gain access to more magic. This exists as a thing to work on over the course of the game. The sequels in each arc handle it a little differently than this one, but each of the beginning games handle it more or less the same as first chapter. Now if this sounds tedious, in first chapter this is helped by the fact that aside from Estelle and Joshua, the other party members are largely guest characters that only join for one chapter. They usually will have almost all of their slots unlocked, so if you ask me, you should just focus on Estelle and Joshua. Alright, so let's talk about what you do outside of combat for a bit. This is probably the most standard aspect of Trails. As mentioned earlier, each chapter of FC is set in one of five major regions, each featuring a central town that has its own Bracer Guild branch. What do you do in these chapters? Well, aside from general story progression, there are side quests. Each quest in the game essentially gives you points, and at the end of the game, those points are added up to give you an overall score. If you want the best score in the game, you will have to complete every single quest. Now, I imagine this sounds tedious if you're used to games like Xenoblade, but compared to that, there actually aren't that many quests in the game. See, each of these lengthy chapters typically has around 9 optional quests. Many quests lead to genuinely little great moments you never get in the main plot. They are all really fun and it just gets better as the series progresses if you ask me. It can get repetitive at points, especially early on, but I think they put enough care into the quests that I found them very enjoyable. A personal pet peeve of mine are when RPGs really over rely on monster hunting quests, where you are dumped with 20 hunt quests at once that exist just to give you loot and experience. 
For trails, I found most either lead me to a new area, a challenging mini-boss that tested my skills, or ones that fleshed out the world, or led to a comedic moment. Now an unfortunate trait of the Trails series is that these games are not friendly to completionists. While I'd say later games are better but also worse in a lot of ways, there are a ton of missables throughout every single one of these games, most notably hidden quests that might have some weird requirements. My friend Stupid Studio Zen who helped collect footage for this video ran into a situation where a quest did not appear for him when it should have, meaning that he could no longer accept the quest. In order to get it, he would have had to load a save several hours back, and I can definitely say I've been there with this game. There are guides that help out, but I've also found sites like the wiki seem to have misinformation on some quests. So best advice I can give is to check the Bracer Guild in one of the four towers in the game after every major story beat, complete every quest you can as soon as possible and never put them off, and check guides for quest related NPCs if you can find a reliable one. Also, while exploring, there isn't really any town looting like Golden Sun and Dragon Quest. However, in the outside areas, there are plenty of treasure chests. But most notably, there's the Trail series take on Mimics, the Monster Chests. Sometimes, when you open a chest, you are ambushed with a squad of monsters. These can be some of the more difficult fights in the game, and I actually like these a lot. It's a little strange how a group of 20 monsters hang out in chests on the regular, but these fights often bring up enemy formations that really make you think, and I like that. Also helps that you are given a retry option anytime you get a game over, so this series can go as hard as it wants with enemy encounters and you get to just have fun with the combat. It's great. For those of you who appreciate this sort of feature, all three of these games feature New Game Plus with lots of customizable options. If you are a fan of the Tales of franchises handled a little like those games, but it's not locked behind a grade system in this game, and I really like this feature and it makes going for achievements much more convenient. The later games in the franchise tweak this system a bit, but all three Sky games handle it pretty much the same, so I'm gonna leave it at that. Speaking of the Tales of series, these games also feature a cooking mechanic where you can make food that has various different effects. Personally, I didn't use this mechanic much in this trilogy compared to later games, but it's there. If you do use this mechanic though, anything involving acerbic tomatoes is basically a win button in this game since you get CP, so go ahead and go for it. Now, if you are playing the series for the first time, I personally advise you play them on normal. The Sky games are actually some of the hardest games in the series on higher difficulties and could potentially turn off newer players. This isn't to say you won't enjoy it, but this is largely going by me and others' experience. However, if you do find yourself getting stuck at higher difficulties, there is a failsafe in this game. All three of these games have a really weird mechanic called the Retry Offset. While turned on, every time you hit Retry, the enemies are nerfed a little bit to give you an easier time. Now, I personally do not mind this sort of mechanic existing, but what I don't like is it is on at default and the games make no attempt to warn you about it, so if you want to turn that off, go into the settings and do that. Now I want to talk about the music, because it is so good in this series, guys, you have no idea. If you have not played Yeast or any of Falcom's other games, they have some great music. For this game specifically, I think the music captures the tone very well, and as the scale escalates, the music becomes more grand as you progress. Now that said, I don't think First Chapter is even close to my favorite soundtrack in the entire series. A lot of the tracks are very low-key, and a lot of the battle themes in particular are really not that intense in this game, which really reflects the tone that I've already established. However, I think the music that is here fits incredibly well. For example, there's the regular battle theme which captures the aloof personality of Estelle perfectly. The cyclical tower theme, reusing the opening melody and capturing the vibe of a mysterious ancient civilization. As well as just some bops.
Then there is probably the most famous song of the entire Sky Trilogy, Silver Will. The presentation of these early Trails games is also something I find incredibly endearing. Despite using pre-rendered sprites, they managed to actually create fairly good fight scenes and cinematics, which actually kind of blows my mind a bit. I also find some of the S-Craft animations in this pretty good, though I think later games definitely have them beat. S-Crafts in this are animated similar to several special attacks in other JRPGs, most notably Mystic Arts and Tales of. Now if you want further evidence that Falcom has the writing team trapped in a room desperate for escape, well there's the novels. See they have in-universe light novels with some of these being really friggin long, and every game in the franchise having new ones. Now I haven't read a lot of Skies, but I have read all of the Cold Steel novels, and the wild part is some of these are really good and engaging. Fun fact I used to read in high school, a little, so I can say this series is maybe cultured again. Kinda. Now I don't recommend you read all of them per se, I mean I definitely recommend Carnelia and First Chapter for reasons, but you don't really need them to understand the plot of the games. However, I do recommend you read the liberal news. Man, someone just did a double take at that statement, I'm sure. Earlier I mentioned that Niall and Dorothy are reporters. Well, over the course of the game you can purchase articles of the liberal news to be updated on events happening outside of the scope of the main plot. It does a great job of fleshing out the country, but it isn't entirely needed to understand the story, so if you really want to skip them, you can go ahead and do so and I think you'll be fine. Alright, so this is just something random, but I want to talk about a running joke these games have for Western players. Basically, once you have opened a chest, you can investigate it again to get a joke. There are a few repeats, but a ton of the chests in the games have unique jokes and puns, with third introducing entire short stories split across installments in the chests. Most famously, the Trails in the Chest story. See, these games were localized by Xseed, and I haven't really found any interviews about this, so this is all conjecture on my part, but this was not a joke in Japan. Going to talk game dev for a second, so basically when you investigate an empty chest in the Japanese version, it just says the chest is empty. However, I think every one of these text boxes were instanced, meaning they were unique to each chest. So I think during localization, someone got tired of copy-pasting the chest is empty, and just started putting jokes there instead. Now I don't know if that's true, but if it is, that is hilarious, and it's in all three Sky games, and I adore this joke. So this is not an unpopular opinion, but I believe this game is the best game to start the Trail series with. Its combat is fairly simple to understand, the story is low key and does start a little boring, but if you can push through the first few chapters and get into the exciting stuff, it's a great game. I think this is a very cute and wholesome journey that wants you to connect with Estelle and Joshua, going with them every step of the way. I think my friend said this best, if you can push through this game, then you can do the rest of the series. On my first playthrough, this was one of my favorite RPGs in years. It isn't perfect, but I do have fond memories of first chapter, and it does an excellent job setting up its sequel. This game is very important to fully understand the context and characters that appear all throughout the future titles, and if you plan to play the Sky games, you definitely need to play this before second chapter. It has some rough edges, but trust me, it's worth it. Plus, you can find it for like $20 on Steam here in the States, and it goes for sale all the time, usually for half price for around $10, and it should run well on most PCs, so if you can get a hold of it, trust me, it's a steal. The best thing is, this game is not even close to my favorite game in the series. Anyway, on to Trails in the Sky, Second Chapter. Trails in the Sky Second Chapter is one of my favorite games of all time. This was a sentiment I felt back when I first played the game back in 2019, and I still do. After a abrupt ending to the first game, I was absolutely ecstatic to see what was next, especially after the first game managed to completely win me over. 
However, now that I have played every Trails game after this with tons of quality of life changes, presentation improvements, and a plethora of other things this game will be competing with, does this game hold up as one of my favorites? Well, let's jump in. Now before we continue, this game is a direct sequel to Trails in the Sky first chapter, and therefore the visuals could possibly spoil you to playable characters or events that happened in that game. If you want to totally avoid spoilers, especially if you are currently playing the first game, I will avoid saying as much as I can, but I do want to share my thoughts. If you need to, go play the games and come back and this video will still be here. Anyway, let's talk about the most beloved game in the Trails series, Trails in the Sky, second chapter. Trails in the Sky first chapter and second chapter were originally meant to be one game, but it was getting to be a bit too long so they had to split it into two. If you have clear data from Trails in the Sky first chapter, you get a lot of neat bonuses depending on what you did. Your levels carry over, some NPCs will remember you and give you items for completing their quests in first chapter, and it really helps hammer in the feeling of these two being one big adventure, with the continuity really adding to the immersion. Now if you are a fan of Golden Sun like me, all of this will sound pretty familiar including the whole game split, which is fun. Though unlike Golden Sun, this doesn't transfer items, quartz, and equipment. Though nonetheless, I love this sort of stuff obviously, and having it in the game at all is just really fun. They do have a justification for the quartz though, and it happens every game, which is amusing. Basically every sequel character's ornaments upgrade to a new type, and therefore they can't use the old quartz. It's like in Kingdom Hearts where plot stuff made Sora just lose all of his stuff. It is fun that they acknowledge it though, but nonetheless, it kind of sucks to see in a way. Now something I need to address obviously is that this series is not one where the sequels work as a standalone experience. I think if you played this without playing FC you'd be pretty confused and missing a lot of necessary context. There was an OVA that is available on Hulu for some reason that is actually an adaptation of this game by itself and it goes through so many of the plot beats in a way that really doesn't do it justice. If you see anime footage that's where it came from. Now there is a lot I could talk about because this game is a chunky one so like last time I am going to briefly talk about the premise. This will require me to somewhat spoil the first game so skip this timestamp right here. I'm gonna have a few of these timestamps in this so stay alert. Anyway, let's go ahead and do this. So at the end of FC, we saw Estelle and Joshua go their separate ways in a pretty dramatic scene, as the Society of Ouroboros was also revealed at the end of that game, working to cause chaos in Liberal. As an aside, this exchange at the end of FC honestly broke me for real, and I was crying so much man when I finished this game, it was insane. This game picks up immediately after that scene as Estelle prepares to look for and stop the Society of Ouroboros, the new villains of this game. Second chapter is quite a meaty game compared to the first game. Where FC could be finished under 60 hours, SC if you know what you were doing, clocks in at around 72 in-game hours, though my original playthrough took me around 90 hours. If I hadn't played Three Houses prior to playing these, this would have been the longest RPG I had played up to this point. There's a lot of story and a lot of reading just like last time. Now while there is a lot of reading, I love the story of this game. There were lots of loose ends from the end of the last game and I'm very glad to say that this game deals with all of them while keeping what setups it has for later games subtle. I can say this right now, the story is probably the single best part of the Trails series for many and I think Trails in the Sky, FC, and SC have the most well crafted narrative of the series. SC is much darker than the first but not oppressively so. Things have escalated and while you are going to the same places the pacing is much tighter. The quests are much more consistently paced and in general this game moves much faster than the original. Sky SC is once again set in the land of Liberal, which means you will be exploring a lot of the same places again. But the game overall is a bit less willing to waste your time, and unlike last game, you actually keep your party members for the most part chapter to chapter, which really improved the gameplay, but I'll talk about that in a bit. 
In this game, we are now faced with a new group of villains, the Society of Ouroboros. Think of your usual anime villain organization, the Akatsuki from Naruto, Organization 13 from Kingdom Hearts, etc. Something the first chapter never really had in its narrative but didn't really need was a rival antagonistic force. However, the Ouroboros aren't just a bunch of cool villains with powers, but they are also really well developed characters that actually forward the development of many of the characters in our party. If you love the cast from first chapter, they get even more development this time around, with Shara, Tita, Agate, Zinn, and Olivia all getting characters to bounce off of, and by the end of the game, if any character didn't win you over in FC, I think SC has a good chance to completely steal your heart. I love this cast with all of my heart, and I don't feel this way about most JRPG casts. As for Estelle, she is given the singular spotlight in this game and you really get a sense that she has really grown as a character after the events in the first game. While she keeps her spunky personality with this game having most of her best lines, she also seems more mature in how she approaches situations. She is probably the best protagonist I have followed in any RPG at this point. Maybe someone will disagree with me though, but hey, I don't care. There are also a few other characters I want to mention. First is the new character Kevin Graham, who immediately reminded me of Vash from Trigun when I met him, as well as Annalise, who was in the last game but actually becomes playable in short sections of this game. Kevin is a traveling priest that we meet in the opening hours of this game, featuring a goofy and aloof personality often hitting on Estelle, which may or may not be serious, I don't know, it's kind of hard to read this guy sometimes. He is really nice though and he gets a lot of focus in the next game, while having tons of great moments in this one. Annalise is a bracer girl that loves all things cute and is a practitioner of the eight laves, one blade sword style that gets a lot more attention in later games. She's a cute character herself, again though she isn't playable for very long, as most of that is in the prologue of this game. As for the Ouroboros members themselves, I also love them. Though this is also the game where many of them were introduced, which means they have a bit less time to develop than the core cast, but man, they leave such an impression with probably the greatest villain theme song I have ever heard. There's also the main villain which I'm choosing to keep anonymous for now but is probably the most despicable, disgusting, manipulative, evil, conniving, snake-like, psychopathic, soulless character I have ever experienced in a while. Honestly, very entertaining. Now I'm going to talk about some spoilery things for this game before I jump into the gameplay section, so please use this timestamp right here to skip this. Sorry to use another one, but I want to throw a bone for people who have played this before, so let's gush about some of the new characters. Ren is a very fascinating character for reasons I won't go into in this video, but when I first met her I knew she had a Nendo which told me she had to be important. She starts off seeming like a normal girl only for you to find out she definitely isn't. The directions they take this character are pretty great, especially revisiting the game. She's a testament to how many things this game subtly sets up and you'd have no idea until later. Another character is Luve, with a name I've heard pronounced multiple ways. I've played this game subbed, so I'll be going with Luve, but apparently when he's mentioned in later games in dub, it's Luve? Anyway, this character is sort of the Camus or Camus, which is really funny, of Ouroboros in a sense if you're familiar with Fire Emblem archetypes. He has a really dark past, and while not as interesting as some other characters, I understand where he's coming from and he remains loyal to their group. Then there's my man Joshua, who has been through some really awful things, and in this game you can really see him as a former broken man driven by resolve. They do some really cool stuff with him, with one section of the game basically making him the coolest character ever. It's a bit anime, but man, I love it, and you'll definitely be seeing more stuff like that in this franchise. Also, there's the Kapua Sky Pirates who were introduced in the last game and get a much more major role in this game. They are also there to help out Joshua, which is a dynamic I did not expect, but I like it a lot. You also learn much more about them, and I know several people who hate Josette as they created this weird love triangle dynamic, but I think she's cool, though I definitely understand the hate. Legit, I don't say this lightly, but this game's story was an emotional roller coaster. I think looking back to when I played it back in 2019, I cried multiple times, and I'm not one who normally does that when I play games, so this is to let you know that it really did emotionally affect me, and I think it was something I really needed at the time, and I think it is a really, really good plot, and the characters are great, and just seeing them develop is fantastic, I, I just love the story of this game. If you play RPGs for their stories, then the first two Sky games are a must play, and masters of world building. There's so much I could gush about, but I'm gonna put a lid on this for now and get back to the gameplay. 
So in the original version of my script, I didn't have that much to say about the combat, but after replaying the game, boy, I am about to gush. But first, before I indulge myself with that, let's talk about the exploration in this one for a bit. You are still running around doing Bracer Go quests for NPCs in this game, and the game loot from last time is pretty much intact. You arrive in an area, there are quests on the board, do around 8 quests per chapter, repeat. Now a weird quirk of the quests in this game is there are usually quests available at the start of chapters this time, giving you a little more to do in previous areas before you move on. Now compared to FC, the pacing for this game is much tighter, with the plot progressing relatively fast in each region until you get to the second half where things really kick into gear. Now there was a moment in first chapter where you had to fish for an achievement, however this is a game that properly introduces fishing as a mainstay side activity in the Trail series. Every single game after this features fishing of some kind. It's kind of a meme these days that every RPG RPG has to have fishing, but hey, Trails did it pretty early. Now fishing in the early Trails games is kind of a matter of trial and error, it's more about choosing the right rod and bait, and then using smaller fish you've caught to catch the bigger fish. The important thing is to watch for that exclamation mark and smack the confirm button, or at least that's what I would say if the timing weren't so strict in this game. Sometimes the window for it is so narrow that your brain doesn't exactly process to press the button in time. So in actuality, I started actually looking at the rod itself and noticed when it bobbed and then I would press the button. Now I want to revisit this point I'm about to make when I get to Crossbell, but I believe those games made this a bit more generous. Unlike later games, this is only really required for one small quest, it's fairly unobtrusive and by the time I played Azur, I weirdly had fun with this side activity. God, I just admitted I liked fishing in a video game, what am I doing with my life? Okay, now for combat. Back in 2019, I personally found this game's difficulty to be much higher than the first game, meaning it kicked my butt. This game can be really difficult if you don't have a full grasp on how to use your tools, but since you could just hit retry just like last game when you lose fights, it felt like I could get away with it being honest. Now on my newest playthrough, I had basically the opposite experience with this game than I did with first chapter, or even my first playthrough of this game, but let's go ahead and talk about the combat starting with what's the same. Now I should mention something important, this time around I played on normal as opposed to hard, but even with that I was shocked how much this game was actually balanced like the later games. I was ready to say art's good, crafts suck just like last time, but after playing this I found out you can really break this game in two with the right combinations. SC's combat is exactly the same as FC, though your pool of arts and crafts are largely expanded. This is because of two reasons. One, your ornaments from the last game have been expanded at the cost of losing all your quartz from the first game, but in exchange you can unlock slots fairly easily in this game, with the only difference being that you now have secondary slots. Now this allows you to get spells from the first game fairly easily, while the second slots give you more spells to learn. Crafts are incredible in this game, but this is partly because you start this game with every craft you had at the end of the last game, meaning your arsenal to work with is immediately much larger from the get-go. Additionally, over the course of the game, you'll learn new crafts, upgrades to previous crafts, and brand new S crafts. Now one brand new addition is the Chain Attack Graft. Using this, everyone in the game is able to spend CP to do team attacks with your allies. When I first played this game like an idiot, I wrote off this skill since it burned out a lot of my character's turns. However, on this replay, it's an incredible addition that really busts open some fights. I was dumb. Later games definitely have their own variations of this mechanic, but this is probably its most busted incarnation. It costs very little to activate, and when paired with good equipment, you can really shred some enemies with it when timed on a crit turn. Alright, so let's back this up and talk about what is easily my favorite improvement to the gameplay. You have full control of your party. This game doesn't do the in and out shenanigans that the first game did for most of its runtime. This also means almost every scene in this game has tons of varying dialogue with a very interesting choice early on. At the start of chapter 1 you are given the choice of Agate and Shara to follow you on your journey through Liberal. They actually stick around for several chapters and that alone affects a lot of story moments and adds replay value. Now when I first played this game, I remember this one being really difficult on normal. The challenge has definitely escalated in comparison to first chapter, but on the flip side the game really rewards you with some good stuff for doing quests. You can go really crazy with your party building in this game compared to before. Agate is the heavy one doing crazy damage and featuring a big risk reward skill where he sacrifices HP to get massive amounts of CP. Shara on the other hand has a skill that applies AT advance or accelerate as it's known in later games to several of your party members. This skill is wild because if you plan it out you can get lots of turns off on enemies. Both of these characters are very busted and there are some crazy applications to everyone. I spent so much time in this game messing with equipment, quartz loadouts, and just trying to break the game as much as I could. 
I gave Tina Deathblow 1, for example, for a good chunk of the game, which is fun because Deathblow 1 basically has a random chance to kill enemies, and because of her attacks having an AoE effect, it was sometimes fun seeing an enemy and a mob just get destroyed like BAM! A lot of the S-Crafts in this are also really cool looking and a marked improvement over the first game. The amount of crazy stuff you can do in this game was incredibly fun on a revisit. Ultimately, I think the biggest praise I can give the combat is that while mechanically it is unchanged, this is a case of how you use those tools. The balance for this game is much more my thing, there's a lot of strategy, and the court system is so flexible you can do a lot of crazy things in this compared to last time. In general, this was really fun. Alright, now we get to talk about the soundtrack. Man, the music in this game is good. Now, when I first played this, I wasn't a fan of the regular battle and boss themes as it took a long time for the jazzy style to really grow on me, but revisiting this game, the music in this is absolutely some of my favorite stuff to come out of Trails. Now, a good chunk of the original soundtrack from First Chapter returns in this game and complements all of the areas very well, but the new songs in this really complement the more serious tone of this game. They added Takahiro Unasuga to the soundtrack of this game, and he is my personal favorite Falcom composer. I have more to say about him in Crossbell and especially Cold Steel, but he made a very good entrance in this game getting to do this game's battle theme. Also continuing the jazzy feel is the regular boss theme created by the late and great Wataru Ishibashi. But also as a taste of how there is more of an edge to this OST, here's one of my favorite battle themes in this one, Fate of the Fairies. A lot of the music from this game would go on to become some of the most iconic music in the entire Trail series. Silver Will from the first game is basically the theme song of this game, with its leitmotif playing several times over the course of the game, most notably getting a vocal version of it as this game's opening. The soundtrack for Second Chapter is easily one of my favorites in the whole series, and it is so well done, and easily one of my favorite soundtracks of all time. Alright, so I've done nothing but praise this game so far, and you're probably thinking there has to be an issue with this game, right? Well, yes, there is. Actually, a few. Though they are largely issues I had with the first game, but kinda amplified. Without going into too much detail, Chapter 8 was probably my least favorite part of this game. There was a lot of really cool stuff about it, but it's where this series' lack of fast travel really started to become an issue for me. I don't want to say much more than that though, I'll just say there was a lot of back and forth and I imagine without Turbo I'd probably get really frustrated with the chapter. Another smaller issue is the dungeons. I am not the biggest fan of the dungeons in the Sky games to be brutally honest with you. The camera makes it really easy to be disoriented after you finish a fight and the lack of a minimap doesn't help things. Now they are largely inoffensive and I imagine most RPG fans won't care much about that, but just coming off the excellently designed dungeons in Golden Sun, I feel I can go ahead and point this out. 
A unique issue to this game is the actual process of swapping characters. This is probably the least offensive issue, but I found it kind of tiring in the final chapter in particular. Basically, in order to swap characters, you had to manually return to the guild to be able to swap. Now, yes, this makes sense in regards to realism or whatever, but man, it is not convenient whatsoever. Add on to this that the cast gets pretty large by the end, and maybe you want to bring some characters to different fights, that means you gotta backtrack. Also, unlike last game where the characters tag out between chapters and unequip their stuff, this does not happen in SC. If you need some equipment, you'll need to figure out who has it, swap them in, and check their gear. Most of the time this was a non-issue for me since I had a game plan and largely had my party built like I wanted, but the final chapter... Yeah, not so much. I had to turn up the turbo speed in the final chapter to keep my sanity with this, since you have to backtrack really far to swap, and they kind of incentivize you to swap during that chapter as well, which just kind of... sucks. Now, none of these issues really ruined the game for me though, and even in Chapter 8, there was a lot of cool stuff that happened in it, and in fairness, there's a little more going on in the dungeons in this game than in FC, and I still enjoyed the fights in them. Plus, the benefits of the party building for me far outweigh the tedium of actually swapping them out, and I still had a very, very fun time with this game. Trails in the Sky Second Chapter is one of the best RPG sequels I have ever played. Compared to some later Trails games, I was ready to say this one was about as flawed as last game, but after this replay, I was very pleasantly surprised. It is incredibly fun and narratively, it is one that probably impacted me the most. I really don't think I'd be as big of a fan of the series as I am without this game. This is an RPG that managed to bring me to tears multiple times, featuring one of the best soundtracks I have ever heard in an RPG, and just had some really solid pacing. As I said, it isn't perfect, I was quite ready to grill this one in places, but I am quite happy this game was just as fun the second time as it was the first. This game is the most beloved title of the series, and I think most people will agree with that, and honestly, yeah, I see it. This one costs a little more than first chapter on Steam, but considering the game took around 70 hours to complete, I think it's absolutely worth the price of admission. I think first chapter is 100% required material for this though, but I don't personally see that as a problem. If you liked first chapter, I think you will love second chapter. I really hope I accurately communicated how much I love this game, it's my second favorite Trails game, and the fact that it rises above its flaws, and the flaws of the first one so well, is incredible. I think this is a fantastic game, one of the best games in the Trails series, I'm not really pushing against the grain on that one, but I can't recommend it enough, I think it is fantastic and you guys should definitely play it. Regardless, we have one more game to look at, and this one is a weird one, it's Trails in the Sky, the third. Trails in the Sky the Third is an interesting title. I mean literally, look at the title. It's not third chapter, it's the third. What is this, Kingdom Hearts? Oh god! Jokes aside, if you found yourself getting a bit burnt out exploring Liberal in the last two games, this game changes things up quite a bit. To begin, the main character shifts away from Estelle and Joshua, and instead focuses on Kevin and a new character named Reese as our new main characters. As I mentioned before, Kevin was introduced in the last game, and therefore we had a bit less time with him, but since he is now the main character, we get a lot more time to develop him in this game. However, this is actually one of the small ways in which this game decided to change things up. You see, if Sky 1st Chapter and 2nd Chapter were originally meant to be one game, then Sky the 3rd is the post-game. Now what do I mean by that? Well, the last couple games you spent exploring Liberal, however, this game takes place in a pocket dimension of sorts. This pocket dimension, called Phantasma, sucks in Kevin and Reese at the start of the game, trapping them inside. Your goal? Escape the dimension. The story of this game is actually significantly simpler than the previous two games, and because of it taking place in a pocket dimension, there is a general sentiment towards this game being skippable. Now I personally do not agree with that, as this game does a lot to build up the world and set up later games, but I'll get into that in a bit. 
Now, because of this setting, this game has more of a level-to-level -level structure, with each level constructed from places you had been to in the last couple games. Now, you may be having Chain of Memories flashbacks if you played Kingdom Hearts, but this game still manages to feel like a normal Trails game for the most part. The combat is still very intact, though with some big additions and tweaks. There are no card game shenanigans to be seen, thank god. Now, as you explore Phantasma, you will find party members from the previous games who have also been trapped inside, as well as several new playable characters that I won't spoil, but it's really neat. Now, since you don't have any towns to explore and you are not bracers this time around, you may be wondering what optional content there is in this game. Well, that's where the doors come in. There are 25 doors, each of them providing a variety of optional content. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that most of this game's content lies in these doors. Most doors are side stories that exist anywhere on the trail's timeline leading up to when third begins. They essentially serve almost as slice of life filler episodes where you get a deeper exploration of the characters and their past. Other doors might give you some additional lore about the Trails universe, such as the Salt Pill incident, while other doors might include minigames that vary from entertaining to PAIN. This game also uses the doors to subtly set up events in the following Crossbell and Erebonia arcs. Now, if you really like the towns in the previous games, a fun trait of this game is that your ever-growing party of characters are always hanging out back at the base, and you can get a lot of really fun scenes with everyone if you choose to backtrack. Also, during select doors, you do get to explore towns and stuff, so it's not like that is completely absent in this game. Now, in regards to the story, despite its unconventional setting, it actually manages to be really good, especially once you hit the last act and everything comes together. Now, most of the story's runtime is pretty minimal if you ignore the doors and mostly serves to set up the third act, but when you hit that point, this game is possibly the peak of the entire Sky Trilogy. Kevin's character quickly goes from a quirky member of the cast to one of the best characters in the series. Legit, this man had a bummer of a life, and the way the game goes about depicting his emotions is really creative and well done. At the start of every chapter, you get a flashback of Kevin's past where a lot of mystery and intrigue is, and while he's not my personal favorite main character, he's definitely a a complex one, and I love that. Then there's Reese, who despite being an entirely new character in this game, quickly became one of my favorites. She's pretty cute, loves food a lot, and I do mean a lot, while also being kind of an anchor for Kevin. Now the surrounding cast doesn't really get that much extra development in the main narrative itself, as they wanted to go through the doors for that, but given that this is following up on two games with this cast, I think that is perfectly fine. I've seen some people take issue with how simple this narrative is compared to the rest of the series, and I understand that, but as I'll thoroughly make clear by the end of this video, this game is kind of a different beast. The side content is absolutely a part of the narrative this time as far as I'm concerned, and the game really does flesh out whatever loose ends it can, while also being very emotional. Also, this game is probably one of the darkest games in the series and really handles many of its subject matter seriously and with care. But there's also a lot of levity too. I think if you are into emotion-driven narratives, this game is definitely for you. In regards to the gameplay, the foundation is the same as Sky's second chapter, but there's a lot more meat to the combat this time. This game's major selling point is that every playable character from the last couple games return, as well as a few newcomers. Because of this, third is easily the Sky game with the most freedom from a gameplay perspective. Something that is somewhat better in this game is the character management. Like second chapter, you can only swap characters back at the base. However, unlike previous games, you can fast travel in this game, which largely makes this a non-issue. On top of that, you can freely manage everyone's equipment and quartz when at the base without swapping them in, which makes things a lot more convenient. That said, I really wish you could also manage this stuff while in the dungeons themselves, but this is nonetheless a huge improvement on second chapter, so I'll give it a pass. As for the orb mint, it's basically the same as at the end of the last game, though your quartz are all mysteriously broken at the start of this game, so you'll have to start from scratch once again, including the slots. Which might be the most contrived way I've ever seen these games start you from zero, but hey, is what it is, I guess. I actually found the process of managing my quartz a lot more involved in this game due to the much larger cast, as I found myself constantly unequipping stuff to equip onto my exploring four characters for the chapter, which did get old at points, but I still appreciated the customization in this game. Also, this game allows you to transfer your save data once again, but because of this game's structure, your rewards for doing so aren't quite as good this time. You transfer your levels and get an admittedly good accessory early on for getting an a rank Bracer status in second chapter, but aside from that, you don't really get much, which may be disappointing, but it is amusing that you start the game around level 90 this time. It's fun seeing that progression. Now, one of my favorite additions is the support effect feature. While exploring in dungeons, you can select a character from the map screen to add some modifiers to your party's stats. These passives are excellent, though I definitely use some characters more than others. Some will increase the rate of Sepeth gain, some will increase 
increase stats, some will increase your EXP gain, and some will increase your drop rate for items. It's just a nice system. A small problem I have with this game though is that your party in the back does not level up unless you bring them, far as I know, and with the cast this large it means sometimes you'll have some stragglers, which is why the EXP bonuses are a very welcome addition, though it can feel kind of like a band-aid solution to the problem, when I think it just would have been better to level up your back party members when you don't bring them to the front. Now for the combat. In this dimension, the higher elements are present. If you are familiar with later Trails games, you know what this means, but for those of you who don't, allow me to explain. Basically this entire game, there are some extra bonuses on the turn wheel, and they add much more to the game in the way of strategy. Let's go ahead and break down some of these. First is Nullify, which can be good or bad depending on the situation. Basically, any damage done on one of these turns will be nullified, so ideally you want this to land on enemy turns and not on yours. But whenever I got it, I basically just used the opportunity to heal or wait since you get less of a turn penalty for doing so. It's kind of annoying when that happens, but it's not the worst. Then there's the double action one, which actually becomes a mainstay in the following games. This one gives you an immediate action the next turn, which also applies to spells allowing you to instant cast. And then there's my personal favorite, the death turns, which allow you to instantly kill most enemies without fail with a melee attack that turn. Now this also works for enemies, so you want to try and keep them from getting it wherever possible, but I love getting it, and it's just a lot of fun. And then there's Vanish. Vanish sucks. Basically, whenever an attack is dealt on a Vanish turn, the opponent disappears from the fight for around 3 turns. This applies both for enemies and for you. And if your entire party is hit with Vanish, that's a game over. The most annoying part is that if your character gets Vanish, they lose all of their MP. On the flip side, if an opponent's entire party gets Vanished, you get a victory, but you do not get any experience for it. Overall, not really a fan of this one. Vanish aside, all of these additions require you to pay way more attention to the bonuses and add some fun chaos to thirds battles compared to the previous two games. Outside of the turn bonuses, there were some spells in previous games that existed outside of the weakness typing, but with the higher elements present, you now have them as additional weakness options to pay attention to, which is pretty neat. To talk about balance for a second, this game is basically designed for Sky Super fans, meaning that a lot of the wacky balance I enjoyed in SC is now a lot more rigid. Now I did plan hard for this game, so that might be part of it, but it did feel like this game handles the balance of arts versus crafts the best out of the entire trilogy. It also taught me to rely on tactics outside of my usual strats for this series, and I really enjoyed myself. Overall, I'm sure I've made it abundantly clear how much I love the combat in this series, with this game pushing me to my limits in particular. And I really had a lot of fun with it, and I really hope you guys do too if you decide to play the games. Overall, this game was a lot of fun, and I cannot recommend it enough. Now it's time for a change of pace. Let's talk about the doors. Ah, hello, Ed Boys! Many doors, yes? Too much? The doors are where the bulk of this game's content takes place. They are very worth doing as you actually get lots of really good rewards from them such as money, quartz, and equipment. There are a total of 25 doors in the game with 3 categories for each of them. Long term story doors known as moon doors, short term story doors known as star doors, and mini game doors known as sun doors. Once you have done every single door in the game you are able to view one last door with a teaser of what's to come. Let's start with the moon doors because that's what the game does. These doors are probably some of my favorites, but they are really long. Early into the game, the first door you encounter is basically an hour straight of cutscenes, and that basically sets the tone for what I mean. Some of these doors have gameplay, some do not. Some let you explore, some are a gauntlet of cutscenes. And then some doors be like... Dragon Tales, Dragon Tales, it's almost time for Dragon Tales. Come along, take my hand, let's all go to Dragon Land. Jokes aside, I think your mileage with these doors will largely depend on how invested you already are in the Sky Universe, which if you played the first two is likely to be high, but I feel I need to mention that anyway. Personally, I think they're great, but I could see someone being annoyed that it might be taking them away from the main part of the game that they like. I think the worst of it was in my original playthrough when I did Chloe's door and had it take two hours to finish. I'm looking at you, Lecter! This door gave Chloe a lot of great backstory, but also gave us Lecter a rundell with the most intentionally annoying introduction they could possibly give this man. He is a master at wasting my time. Back in the day, this was one of the last doors I had to do, and half of it was checking random areas looking for this slacker, and I was not a fan. But this time around, I actually like this door a lot. Best advice I can give for this entire series, and particularly for this door, is don't try to blitz it. Take your time. There is a lot of nuance in all of these Trails games, and you'll appreciate later reveals better with this mindset. 
The short-term doors, also known as star doors, are a bit more all over the place? Allow me to explain. Some doors are basically small 20-minute filler episodes to flesh out characters you didn't have much time with before. And I like these a lot and kind of wish they could have trimmed down a few of the longer doors to be more like these. The others are lore doors. So these ones I found very fascinating, especially the salt pail one. You really get to explore and learn a lot about places outside of Liberal in these, and a lot of this becomes relevant in later games, which is crazy. But admittedly, most of the lore doors are just a bunch of text to read, and I found all of them fascinating on different levels, but I imagine they may not do anything for some people. And then, there's this door. Alright, so I mentioned there being really dark material, and that's mostly one door. This door portrays a backstory that is, uh, pretty messed up, in a way the Trails doesn't normally do. For what it is, it's well written and really makes you understand a certain character, but just be warned, it's definitely sensitive material. Now we have the minigame doors, known as Sun Doors. Oh boy, there are five of these doors, and my opinions of them are a tad all over the place too. There's a shooter minigame that has terrible controls, a quiz show with Campanella that is pretty amusing, a blackjack and poker door, and lastly, an arena. The arena is probably my favorite of these doors, since you really get to test your skills with the combat with some pretty crazy fight matchups. This also contains probably one of the most brutal fights at its highest difficulty that I won't share for spoiler reasons, but hey, if you wanted a super boss for the Sky Trilogy, here you go. Now a few of the doors in this game will have additional parts that will require you to bring certain characters or items such as the arena, so try to keep an eye out for that. Now I think my favorite thing about the minigame doors is that they have these really quirky artworks that parody other games and anime. Like look over here, it's Puyo Puyo- OH NO! NO! GOD PLEASE NO! 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 The fishing door. So basically, as a still, you have to challenge this fisherman in a battle royale of sorts. Meanwhile, you're stuck in the hell that is this minigame. Everything is RNG. I feel death. Why must I be here? The Hell Falcon it has been weeks. I'm starving, and no, I'm not going to eat the fish. This fishing minigame is kind of infamous. Remember what I said about the fishing last game and how it works? Well, this is the game where you have to get good. To win, you have to score more points than the opponent. The larger the fish, the larger points you obtain. On paper, there's definitely an element of skill to this, but there's also a lot of RNG and a lot of BS. You can have your opponent get extremely lucky, and all you can do is just play the best you can. In the last round, if luck is not on your side, you are just going to lose no matter how good you are. It is a huge time sink. But you know, considering later games would expand on the fishing and make larger quests involving them, it is a very good bootcamp for what comes later. I guess that's a compliment? Is what I would say before I replay this! So, I got in a call with some friends while I did this minigame because I thought it'd be funny and some shenanigans went down. Oh, come on. Oh, wait, is it the exclamation mark this time? Did they actually fix it? I, I don't think you're, <laughs> you're understanding the gravity of this situation again. This, this is much, much better than second chapter. Fun fact, the fish you obtain is not actually luck-based, but rather is based on your timing with pressing the button. Timing that is very, very, very precise. I had to look up how to do this because the last round I just wasn't catching fish and there was advice like turning the music down in the settings to hear the beep. It's all RNG and the funniest one, spam the confirm button at first and slowly lower the rate of pressing the button until you get one. Fun fact, the latter was actually the most accurate one. And then once you think you're in the clear, you then stop doing that and then you press it every second. <laughs> Sounds comfortable. Here's an easy way to win this minigame that I have managed to dub the Mississippi Strategy. Yes, I'm about to explain an exploit that I discovered. So because the devs want you to time your button press, if you press it early, it resets the timer for the exclamation mark to appear. So basically, you mash until you think it's reset, then you count Mississippis and press the button every Mississippi. You will win, provided luck is on your side. Oh, Mr. Fishing Baron, huh? Not looking so good over there. I'm gonna regret doing this, but man, look at you with your measly 500 points while I have 1700. There's no way you could win this. Please don't prove me wrong. I would be very embarrassed. He is quietly here from underneath his Japanese uh, voice actor. From Mississippi to Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> this minigame is awful, but hey, maybe this really funny strategy will save you some headache. That is a positive, the music for this minigame is pretty darn cute, but after being in this minigame hell for so long, it triggers a fight or flight response in me. On the topic of the soundtrack, I love it. Now, chapter 2 of this game had me kind of concerned as I feel a lot of the area themes in this go for more of an ethereal vibe, but this is probably one of my favorite soundtracks in the whole series after revisiting this game. 
First, the battle themes in this have gone in a bit of a different direction from the last two games in a way I really dig. There's the main battle theme which takes that ethereal approach to the jazzy style of the previous games, adding reverb, synth, and other stuff to make a really cool sound. Then there's Fighting Right On, continuing the hard rock edge from last game. An overdosing Heavenly Bliss, which sounds a lot like something from Final Fantasy XIII. But also the area themes in this game are a lot more energetic and creative to complement the more level to level structure, just making the game feel fun to play. I also really like the theme song of this game, Cry For Me, Cry For You. It is such a cheesy title, but I think it is my personal favorite opening of the Sky Trilogy. It's really good and reminds me of Chrono Crusade for the, like, two of you who have seen that show. I also want to shout out that some of the music in this really tugs at your emotional heartstrings. There were instances where I just had to take a moment because the narrative and music worked together to just kind of break me. This game also has one of my favorite final boss themes of all time, only topped by a different trail song later on. Overall, I love this soundtrack so much and it definitely deserves a listen. There is a common idea that because of how weird and isolated this game is at surface value that it's totally skippable. It's a sentiment I understand because this is a series with 9 games and counting, and shaving off what you can sounds really appealing. But if you ask me, especially if you are a fan of the world and characters of the Sky series, you should not skip this game. This game is very important, especially to emotional beats in later games. Is it weird? Sure. Is it my favorite? Not really. But I also know several people who say it is their favorite, and with the power of hindsight, I totally understand. This game used to rank pretty low for me when I first played it, but over the years I've kind of realized I've been a bit harsh to it, and in a lot of ways I actually appreciate it a lot because of how much this game sets up. This game pretty much sets up every single game after this that I'm going to be talking about in this retrospective, and it's actually kind of insane because most of it you won't even realize until you run into it later, and I find that really cool. And believe me, you might find your favorite Trails game here, it's very good. Because what this game gets right is some of the best stuff in the series. I think what this game does best is being a send-off to the cast of the Sky Trilogy. You get to play as everyone, see them all interact and learn more about them. You get to build everyone how you want and get a victory lap with all of these characters you spent two games with. Third is a love letter to Liberal and its characters that manages to end off on just as much of an emotional high as the previous game, which really impresses me. I know I said this about the last game, but they got me crying AGAIN! which just shows how attached I got to this cast. This game works as an excellent bookend and send-off for all of these characters you spent hundreds of hours with up to this point, while telling a very deep and emotional narrative about Kevin and Reese, 
and even setting up two of the major arcs after this, which is an incredibly impressive feat. I think if we were to rank these games strictly on gameplay, this is probably one of the best games in the whole series. I definitely recommend this game, especially if you are a fan of Sky's characters. It is a creative and emotional ending to the most character-focused arc in the Trails series. Third is not my personal favorite Trails, but I know it is for a lot of people. It is a great game, and you definitely should not skip it. And with that, here we are at the end of the Sky Trilogy. Revisiting this entire saga has definitely been a bit of a trip. Trails in the Sky first chapter started a saga, and because of that it was a rough beginning in regards to gameplay, but it did its job really well in terms of setting the foundation for later games, and making you care about its characters. Getting to witness a few friends playing first chapter as their first Trails, I gained a lot of appreciation for its narrative this time around. Second chapter was a masterpiece that completely stole my heart for a second time replaying it. I gained a newfound appreciation for the way it improved the combat from FC, while managing to really tie in the pacing in a way that kept me engaged with very little annoying me overall. Sky the Third is a subversive, if not messy, conclusion to this trilogy, managing to completely ditch the formula, tightening the gameplay experience, and putting a nice bow on a story, characters, and setting that really mean a lot to me. These are games with a lot of heart, containing a cute love story at its core, and a plot and setting that feels incredibly creative. This was the beginning of the most fleshed out world that I have experienced in any RPG, and Liberal as a setting is something that I will always hold dear. Because of that, I seriously want to thank XC for their work in localizing these games. I didn't touch on this, but they poured their heart out in the localization and went through hell getting second chapter to release. Without them, Trails may have stayed in Japan and I never would have played these games. Third was released in the West well into the Cold Steel games getting localized, and it was the last Trails game they got to handle. At the end of Third, you can read the chess cheering you on and thanking you for playing their games, and as dumb as it was, it did bring a tear to my eye playing it. I want to thank them so much for helping bring this series into my life. They did an excellent job in their chess message joke was so good that I honestly really miss it in the newer games. I know I'm being incredibly sappy here, but these games do legitimately mean a lot to me. I found these games at the tail end of a really dark period of my life, and it was something that I really needed at the time. Now, this probably makes me sound biased since I can admit that these games did provide me an important source of escape, that much is true, but I think these games gave me a sense of childlike joy a jaded person like myself has not gotten from a series in a long time. If this video convinced you to give Trails a shot, I do really hope you'll have a really fun time. I think the main thing that I would say about this series is that you get back what you put into it. There's an insane amount of detail put into the world building, NPCs, characters, and story that only continue to reward you as you go through the games. I think my friend Blaze, who recently played the game for the first time, said it best, so I'll go ahead and let them take it away. Like I said a couple of times in this review, there is a huge payoff at the end. Pay attention to everything. Everything matters in this game. Your time is not wasted in this JRPG whatsoever. This is very much the MCU of JRPG, so it can be daunting, but it's something I don't regret diving into for a single second. I love this trilogy with all of my heart, and the crazy thing is, I'm hyped to replay the rest of the series. This video has already ended up being the longest review I've ever done, and that honestly terrifies me considering some of the later games. For the next part of this retrospective, I'm working out when to make it for a number of reasons. We'll be looking at games that were trapped in Japan for years, got a fan translation, and now that translation is going to be the basis of an official release. That's right everyone, next time we're going to be going into the Crossbell arc with Trails from Zero and Trails to Azur. These two games are some of my favorite games in the entire Trails series, and I originally played them via the Geofront fan translation, and I'm really excited to talk about them next time, but since Azur will be releasing next year via NIS, I actually will not be getting the full video out until both NIS releases are finished. I know, I'm sorry about that, but that's just how this is going to be. Now that said, I am absolutely excited to really share my thoughts on these games. They're really fun, and in general, I'm also thinking of releasing Zero standalone. That way you guys can experience it kind of like I did with first chapter and second chapter, and I think that's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm also considering doing streams of Zero. If you guys are interested, go ahead and comment down below if you guys would like to see that. I think that'd be a lot of fun, and I just kind of want to gauge some interest on that. I also want to give thanks to my good friend Snive who edited the transitions for me in this video. You can check out his channel in the description, he does GMVs, RPG news, and Let's Plays. I am really proud of how these transitions turned out, in particular SCs, which I had this joke in mind and he really managed to put it together, and I think it's a lot of fun, and I'm really happy that he did it.
I also want to give a huge thanks to my friends Studios, Blaze, Dorman, Kingdom Ace, Notley, as well as my Ko-Fi supporters, who all helped contribute to this video in different ways. Seriously, you guys helped a lot, and I don't think this video would be as good as it is without your input. So again, thank you guys so much. That said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Next time, we're going to be getting over that language barrier. So I'll see you guys next time, and take care. Mm, bye. It's good enough for me to do this gag. Okay. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Zero, no! <laughs> I actually chopped up zero! <laughs> no! <laughs> okay, so I, 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 I can't believe this. this actually freaking sucks. Zero is actually broken, like for real. Like, I don't know how that happened. But parts of his leg joints, like, legit just got obliterated. Like, you can't really tell very well from, like, this leg part. Um, but, like, over on this one, um, you can kind of see that it's, like, almost broken off. Um, and, like, in there, it's supposed to go on, like, that metal tube. Like, this is, this is 100% not a part of the figure that is supposed to ever come off. So, uh, I think Zero is actually freaking dead. And this blows. <laughs> um... I, 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 I hope it was worth it.